All right. Um, really glad to be here talking about hardware to find data centers. Um, uh, it is an S. It is an S. And um, the D is up for grabs, the DC. We know what that's about, right? Uh, you, you know, the, I'm, I'm going to bring a, a different perspective to this one. Um, and, and part of this comes from an entrepreneurial or a, a, a um, economic uh, perspective. But you know, I had a, a guy that I, I worked for early in my life, and he was running a big organization. He said, you know, without employees or without customers, this stuff would be easy. And um, you know, so you start a company, and you're and you're you're working on disruptions. I love disruptions, and you get the employees, and you got half of the headache. And then uh, you're trying to get the customers. And so what we're talking about is a really, really big disruption. And if you can't get the customers, it's, you know, what are we doing here? And there's a trick to getting customers at, at, at times of big disruptions. And you know, we started Viata in around 2006. About 2008, we had our first production uh, system. And we looked, this was pre-virtualization, pre-cloud, pre-SD, fill in the blank. And we said, how are we possibly going to be able to compete against you know, the incumbency of Cisco? Being, I mean, the moat around the castle was wide and it was deep. And we said, you know, we're, we're not going to go bend our sword the same way everybody else did. We're going to take a different approach. We're just going to work to go viral with this, with a free download, and just, just see if people can talk down the naysayers. Because people looked at us like we had seven heads when we were starting the company. You know, this is not what you do. You don't separate software from hardware and do networking. Junior, what don't you understand? It's ASICs and blinking lights. You know, the reason we started the company was because we fundamentally believed that hardware and software were going to separate for big chunks of uh, the networking workload. It was just kind of a matter of time. So in 2008, 2009, 2010 or 11, I finally said, you know what, it's time for us to actually go to a mainstream event. We went to the Gartner Data Center Conference in Las Vegas and all you know, through the three-day conference, all this stuff about virtualization coming online. And I was really waiting for the last day. The last day is when the guys that uh, were running the network research were going to talk about getting your data center ready for virtualization. And I thought, this is it. You know, everything we work for, it's all coming home right here. Went into that room, and they said, OK, virtualization, the first thing you need to worry about, 40 gig. And I'm like wondering if the, if the joke is coming, you know, just, just 40 gig. You know, server density, lots of virtual machines. You're going to have 10 gig out, 40 gig out the top of rack. And I said, OK, well, I'll, I'll give them a buy on that. And they said, OK, the next thing you need to worry about, Cabling. It, it just went on, you know, and I was, where is the innovation happening? When is this going to come around? At some point, they said, SDN, single slide, will let you know it's not there, will let you know when it's time to look. And here's what I took away from that is that all customer types are not the same, obviously. You know, there's type A customers, type B customers, type C. If you're here, you have a, a proclivity to be, you know, type A in terms of your uh, technical interest or, or your, uh, your deployment type of interest. But the trick is that we've got to be able to get to where we can, um, we can get customers. And that is really what this is all about. And the way that you get customers is um, uh, by giving them something that, that, that's worth their worth their while. Now one thing, I just this is just an obligatory kind of shout out. A lot of people ask why did we prepare Viata and Brocade? And the answer is because Brocade is the second largest data center networking company in the world. Um, and it is a very financially healthy company and none of their products compete with what Viata does. Therefore, they can wield a software strategy with impunity. And that's precisely what's happening. So I would actually declare that with everything that's been happening with software um, and networking, that actually 2013 was the year that it really became official. And I promise I won't do any more obligatory plugs about what we do from here on out. It's just all going to be about the industry. But um, the, um, oh, I guess I did sneak one in there. Laugh now. Um, the, uh, the reason I say 2013 is because this is when customers really started going production with software-centric um, products. This is when um, uh, other um, products were, were coming into market. Even the incumbents were saying, hey, we've got a software product over here. We really don't want to tell you about it because it eats into our hardware business. But 2013, I think, will go down in history as the year that software networking actually really took off. Now, why software-defined data centers? Why would a customer do this? Um, there's really only, only two reasons why somebody would embark on a new architecture. And the first one is, you know, because you can. 
uh, because there are technologies that are enabling that. It could be that so you've got new levels of openness and you've got standards and maybe commercial off-the-shelf servers or merchant silicon. You know, there's technology levers that have been removed, different technology impediments that have been moved, and including, you know, even ideas like, you know, using virtual machines or virtual routers or dealing with the virtual machine sprawl and then dealing with overlays or orchestration. These technology impediments are starting to be relieved, but, you know, should you? And that's another reason why it's happening right now, is that you should because the competitive environments that every business is facing are just not being addressed by basically a, a closed mainframe type of a model of, of networking. You know, compute changed 20 years ago. Compute networking, or compute hardware and software changed 20 years ago and it's networking's turn right now. Uh, and it has to because we're not going to be able to meet the commercial objectives that we've got, which is not just the agility and being able to have you know, time to service and all the good things that we've been talking about, but also the fundamental cost models that are here. And you can and you should, but still, when you're talking about something as disruptive as, a, as really considering new architectures, there, you gotta seek alpha in here. And alpha is a, is a financial metric that basically is the return over and above the risk that you took to engage it over and above. If the return is just balanced with risk, customers are going to be, going to be uh, uh, tepid at this. You've got to have the point where the return is in excess of the risk that people are taking on. And if we don't do this, we're not going to get the kind of broad spread adoption that we're going to want. Now, I want to give you a little peek, a different perspective. Um, we all know servers are powerful, right? We all could recite this all day long, right? Do you look at the, uh, the different uh, platforms from Intel, from Nahalem, and on down the line, all that iBridge. Look how many cores we've got. Uh, you know, we're up to getting up to 20 cores here, and not just 20 cores, but each core is more powerful. We know that, right? We know Moore's Law is working, and we also know that each core is fundamentally um, you know, falling in terms of uh, what we used to call MIP price. We know this. Here's the new piece that those same servers, they're becoming network-centric. And this is at the root of a lot of this adoption, right? Network centrism, what does that mean? First of all, just look at the packet processing capabilities inside those same platforms that I talked about. When we started Viata, we couldn't push 100 meg on a 1U server. Okay, now we're talking about, and it really came through with Nehalem, um, and then started off from there. Um, we are to the point where you can drive 10 gig line rate 64, 64 byte packet on a core. This is a fundamental change. This is a, this is a lot of advantage to be gathering from, um, uh, from a change in the infrastructure type. And the reason it's blurry on Ivy Bridge is because they haven't posted that number yet, and I'm not supposed to put it up there. But it is a, you know, and that's just Ivy Bridge. You should see the stuff that's coming down the pipe. So not only are the servers fundamentally capable of a lot more packet processing, but that is actually driving this trend where we're starting to, you know, put bigger hoses on them. You know, moving away from, from one gig NICs and moving to 10 gig NICs. So to a degree, you know, Gartner was certainly right. It's, you're going to have 40 gig at the top of rack because you're going to have 10 gig coming out of the server. It just so happens that the servers are capable of a lot of packet processing that, that nobody had really thought of before. But this has been a trend and, um, and it is going in really, really interesting directions. Um, and along with that, you know, we've got concepts like SDN and NFV, or Network Functions Virtualization. And these are, you know, approaches that really want to take advantage of, you know, really new breakthrough types of infrastructure power. And what's the, I get asked often, you know, what's the difference between the two? I say SDN is how you manipulate the network, and NFV is a new class of infrastructure to be manipulated. It's that simple, right? With SDN, we've got the concept of a controller, the, the ability to um, feed in some logic and, and have the network behavior change. And with NFV, you know, what's underwriting NFV? At the lowest level, what's underwriting NFV is x86, more specifically Intel. You know, this has been a long business development process for Intel. And um, you know, no matter what you talk about with large uh, potential NFV architectures, the, the silent assumption under there is that you're running that on x86 hardware. So, you know, we've, we've been doing this, this V router for a, con for, for a while, and um, uh, we actually, I believe, invented the virtual router. Somebody may have before it, we're just more familiar with it. 
But it's really simple. Why do we do that? Well, you know, when you have a hard network device, it's you know hardware with an operating system on it, and then you've got a compute device, maybe a two-core server, and it's got an app, and it's not virtual. You just string a cable between them, and you have you, you've got packet control, right? You've got you can all your network controls you've got in there, and that's fine. But if you if you take those those two-core servers out of out of service after the three-year duty cycle, what are you going to report and replace them with? They're going to replace them with whatever pretty much cutting edge is. So just, just say you move those up from two core to 20 core. You're going to virtualize those things. And that's precisely, that's one of the things that's fundamentally altering the landscape here is that what we're putting in, something that over 50% over of all the x86 servers installed right now are virtualized and uh, I believe 70% of all that are shipping are virtualized. So we're going we're to be hitting 90% of server virtualization here before too long. And the density that's coming in there is really huge. And the problem is, obviously, that, that hypervisor, that layer of abstraction in there, breaks some of the packet control. And you know, what we found early on was that we could solve customers' problems by taking routing as a virtual machine and putting it inside the servers and reestablishing the, the segmentation and the control and the, the, uh, some of the security that... Um, uh, that they needed, which it, it was, it's, you know, routing, firewall, VPN, all in one, uh, all in, in one VM. And what we found in terms of what customers were adopting, it was the customers that had the kind of scenario where they needed to take advantage of it and they could take advantage of it, and it was the cloud service providers. Why would the cloud service providers be the first ones to do this? Well, two reasons. One, their economic model says that they need to be uh, offering utility services at utility prices. And if they're buying into expensive infrastructure or, or infrastructure with expensive curves, it's going, to, it's going to kill their business model. They can't do it. And the other is they're really, really nimble. Uh, they don't have to worry about their external network. They worry about the network inside of their four walls, and they have to be nimble because it's very public what their comp competition is doing. Any time the competition does one thing, then they've got to be able to stand up that same sort of service if they want to have differentiated or at least a as good as service. So um, what we found was the first really big wave of this relatively non-invasive um, but, but very much uh, you know, modernized form of networking came through cloud service providers in Amazon. Uh, we've got customers running all over Amazon right now. Rackspace has gone global with their network as a service powered by Viata. Click, boom. Click, boom. You know, individual customers getting what they need. Um, matter of fact, I just heard this morning that SoftLayer, which is an IBM company, uh, just went uh, public with their Viata-based uh, service uh, this morning. So, been accumulating a lot of the cloud service providers, and it's because it's that simple. Um, and interestingly, you know, if you wonder, you know, what about the customer? Are they worried about like, you know, the the brand value of what they used to what like they used to buy? Um, well, they don't, because the cloud service provider is the one that's making the infrastructure choice for them. You know, in some cases, and in many cases, the actual brand is is, is occluded from the customer. Um, we also see not just usage in the cloud, but hybrid cloud as well. If I want to be able to burst over into a public cloud, I can use the same, a lot of the same infrastructure in my own private cloud or in my own private data center, have the same skill sets, um, uh, same buying leverage, and then burst over into a public cloud and have some commonality of what I'm dealing with. And this is a very uh, rapidly growing uh, use case. Um, then there's NFV, this telco idea. You know, it's um, last November, the world's 12 or 15 largest telcos wrote a paper, it was a call to action, network function virtualization, and they all said, we're dying. We, we cannot withstand, our business model cannot withstand this kind of, of inflexible, mainframe-esque network infrastructure. We can't do it. It's way too, too inflexible and it's way too cost, uh, costly. You gotta do something about it. And you gotta think about this. You know, the dozen largest carriers in the world came together and said, we all have the same pain. We need these solutions now. So this was a shot around the world that basically said this NFV concept, which again powered by Intel at, at the, for the majority of it at its, at its root, um, you got the you know a dozen of the world's largest IT budgets saying we need that we need that now. So go back to Alpha. I can and I should, and the benefit outweighs the risk of taking it on. So this is, is uh, driving even more adoption in here. And basically what they're saying is, and not at a switching level, but if you look at things like routing and security, there's this, this um, you know, kind of uh, logarithmic function. If you want to buy, from, buy into to, uh, from you know, one gig to 10 gig performance, you're going you're gonna to go up to you know, $100,000 boxes pretty fast. And this is the, the thing that incumbency will do, is they'll actually mechanically restrict 
the, uh, the cards. I've got a 10 gig card. It won't go in that small box. It will only go in the big box. So if you need 10 gig, you've got to buy the big box first. And that is, that's been that model. That's been an artificial constraint. And what NFE is saying is we need to flatten that thing out. We need to get order of magnitude better cost structure out of our infrastructure. And here we're just still talking about CapEx. We haven't even talked about OpEx, which is where the real money is, right? So, um, you know, this is, you know, Viata is somewhere in that space right now. We're going to continue driving a lot of improvements. Uh, but what's really interesting about the incumbency behavior is, uh, and I'm not knocking anybody here, that it's, it's an it's a, uh, innovator's dilemma. You know, so Cisco has come out with a virtual router, CSR 1000V. Guess where they priced it? On the wrong side of the curve. Why would they do that? They do not want that thing out in the wild. It comes at the expense of, they got a $6 billion hardware line. They're going to come kicking and screaming into this space. Back to the point of the unique thing about Brocade is that we don't, Brocade doesn't have any products that compete with the, the Viata product line. So we're going to go tear a hole in this thing and really ride that Intel curve as aggressively as we can. Um, now, once you get to the virtual router, at some point, you know, architecturally, yes, everything is going to create a bottleneck. A single virtual router, is that going to create a bottleneck? Yes. That's why you see this, this move where you've got a global controller with an overlay and it's speaking out to lots of forwarding planes. Concept is not lost on us. Um, but this is, you know, the natural extension of a virtual router. It's a virtual kind of a distributed router. And uh, there's a lot of, a lot of um, very evolutionary ways to get there that pose very little risk for the customer in adoption. So the, the final couple of minutes here is um, I'm going to raise this up a little bit and I'm going to cue off a little bit on some, a question that, that Jeff had asked. You know, what's happening here in the software-defined data center is that we've got this layer of abstraction, right? And as, as, as vendors, we think about you know, our products and everything else. There's two things. There's the core and then there's the context. The core is what our products do. You know, it could be L2, L3, they could be doing L4 service insertion. Um, but that's what our product does. The context is in how customers want to use the products. And the context is the new um, emerging uh, uh, thread that is, is producing a lot of, of um, confusion and opportunity in here. Context are, you know, you can read it up here, you see better than I can. But it's, it's, it's how I want to get this gear deployed. It, you know, it's, it's, it's rack space. I need when the customer asks for it to click a button and turn on the service. You know? Or I need to start thinking about the adaptability and the malleability and maybe the, the uh, uh, self-policing nature of the performance of the network. And you know, this is where you come into things like you know, OpenStack and Open Daylight. You know, it's important that our products um, are very, very well in tune with orchestration and with control because this is where it's at you know CLI you know CLI is the objective of the advanced architecture is to get the CLI behind us right it's where NetOps, NetOps meets DevOps and we start dealing with things like REST APIs and, and we're worrying more about what we're trying to do rather than how it's actually done and I'm glad Ender is here because I'm looking forward to hearing his uh, presentation on open daylight so basically you know again this whole thing is about is about customer adoption um, and you know, them, they're seeking alpha here and managing customer risk. If you've ever been in one of the meetings where you've got this really hot idea and you're talking to the customers and, and they're pushing back and it's the risk, it, it feels a little bit like this. I love this picture. You've got to look at the foreground. So, you know, it, it, you're pushing on, a, pushing on a string here. You know, they're wondering who the clown is that's telling them that they should basically take their jobs in their own hands. Um, and those that do, if they do it too early, find themselves in this position going, now what do I do because this did not work out too well. The Gartner hype cycle is a really perfect curve for describing what we're dealing with and the, the customer's perspective on this because ultimately what the customer really wants is to be able to do this and this isn't going to happen until they're making sure that they're making risk-adjusted decisions for, for broad adoption. So um, it's a really interesting time right now, I think, um, uh, the, the way I think about this um, from an industry ecosystem standpoint is this is networking's open systems era. It happened in compute, like I said, in the 90s when we went from mainframes to you know, Unix systems on Spark or PowerPC or something else. It wasn't a black box where it all came in one kit. Um, we were buying, starting to buy best of breed. There's a layer cake in here. You buy your database that you wanted, your web app engine that you wanted. Um, and that's, so when, when this happens, when you've got a position where, where there's an incumbent, a dominant incumbent, 
you know, with a large market share and um, a couple of uh, also rands, which um, certainly was the case in the in the mainframe market that's I, where I, I started. You know, and there's IBM and then the plug compatibles with uh, you know Hitachi or Amdahl or whatever. But what happens when the change hits is that you go from this closed monolithic design to an open and modular design and history shows that when you have a disruption of this magnitude this is the potential outcome this was the outcome in compute okay. when we went from mainframe to linux uh, to, to unix who was on top sun they weren't in the mainframe who else hp was there who else silicon graphics a whole bunch of guys came in there and it's a challenge it's, a, it's an innovator's dilemma and this is what I think is, um, it makes it commercially very, very interesting right now because I think some really new, great companies are going to come to the forefront of networking. Thank you, Kelly. I think that's it. That's just awesome. Um, I do have one question for you before we, we let you go, which is you, know, you talked about cloud service providers being the driver for this. Um, what is the, you know, can you name one or two specific use cases that are saying this is what this is absolutely what the cloud service provider needs to do, and this is why we're what, this is why we're moving to a software-based approach? Yeah, absolutely, multi-tenancy, and and not on some grand scale, but you know, if every one of you is an individual customer using Rackspace, you're in a shared hardware environment, and you need to have the network segmentation and the and the, the you know firewalling and VPNing types of capabilities that you had in your own physical world. You just don't want to be able to, ha to have, the, uh, have that loss of network controls. And it could be between each other or it could be out to the outside world. You know, you've got a bunch of Linux servers, you need to upgrade them. How can you get out safely? How can you expose your entire infrastructure to the internet safely just to be able to do that? The, the cloud service providers don't give you that much control because they're being as generic as they can with their services because generic has brought us market applicability. So this is, is value-added functionality after the fact that allows them to segment and secure their virtual machines from other people's virtual machines, either uh, within the same uh, data center or between that and the, and, and the wild. All right. So that's the, it's the simplest uh, thing in the world, but it's, it's easily enabled uh, through software. And from Rackspace's perspective, there is zero marginal cost, you know, and they're gross margin positive on day one. So it's, uh, again, the, they, they found alpha. Yep, excellent, great. Well, everyone, Kelly Harrell from uh, Brocade and Viata. Thank Thanks. you, Kelly. Good job.